people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say, that's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. A look at the upcoming Sky Nicholson versus Sarah Mahfoud fight and beyond. Should Sky win and become WBC featherweight champion, what waits for her? Whoever has got the belts, I'll be ready for them. If that is Serrano, then yes, I'll be ready for her, Nicholson told me back in 2022. Even back then, Nicholson had eyes on Serrano. The former Olympian is not only chasing WBC honors, Nicholson wants undisputed status to follow soon after. Serrano with it. The WBC title and Mafood might be next, but Nicholson still wants that dance with Serrano. She won't get it. I don't think she'll get it. I think that after Amanda's upcoming fight with Nina Menke, she means to go back to mixed martial arts. She's gonna she's going back to MMA. She has a deal with the PFL, and I think she's gonna kick off that deal later on this year after the Nina Menke fight, at which point mandatories by way of the other sanctioning bodies, mandatories by way of the other alphabets might be called forcing Amanda to vacate what titles she still has. She still has three of the four. I never thought that Nicholson versus Serrano would see the light of day, and I never liked Sky Nicholson's chances in that fight. They're in very different places in their careers, Sky Nicholson and Amanda Serrano, where Amanda is already accomplished. She's already been there and done that and been in big fights and unified titles and become undisputed, as well as having been a champion at seven different weights, where she's more or less towards the tail end of her career, Sky is just beginning. Sky's just getting started. It's perhaps better for Sky Nicholson and her career that she didn't get the Amanda Serrano fight because I've no doubts Amanda would have beat her. She would have derailed her career and stifled what progress Sky has made so far. The silver lining, however, is that in calling Amanda out, Sky Nicholson made herself arguably the second most recognizable featherweight in the featherweight division, that at minimum, she got press out of it. She got notoriety. She got articles written about her. She got a profile boost. In tandem with her being so close to becoming this division's next WBC champion newly crowned that gives her leverage over the other girls at this weight that gives her leverage over Raven Chapman leverage over Karis Artingstall, Sophia Leash, Sarah Liegman. Because not only is she more recognizable than they are, but she's set to become a champion real soon. I do think she's going to beat Sarah Mahfoud. The article states that if and when she beats Sarah Mahfoud, becomes WBC champion, she means to go after the other alphabet titles. Currently, Amanda's got the other three, but like I said, I don't think that fight is going to happen. I think those titles, they're going to go vacant. So what fighters are in line to become champions like Sky Nicholson is in line to become champion? Well, by way of the IBF currently, Nina Menke is ranked at number one, but after Amanda beats her, and I do think she's going to beat her, she's going to lose ground in the ranks. Nina's currently ranked at number one by way of both the IBF, the WBO, and the WBA, but like I said, once she loses to Amanda, she won't be ranked at number one anymore. Ranked at number two by way of the IBF is Sarah Mafood, but Sarah's about to fight Sky, and when Sky beats her, if she does beat her, she's going to lose ground in those ranks. Ranked at number three is multi-weight champion of Argentina, Daniela Bermudez, and ranked at number four is the United Kingdom's own Raven Chapman. So the way it looks, it looks like the next IBF champion may be decided between Daniela Bermudez and Raven Chapman. Go over to the WBO's rank standings. It's a similar situation. Ignore that Nina Menke is ranked at number one and ignore that Sarah Mahfoud is ranked at number three. Daniela Bermudez is ranked at number two. Daniela Bermudez, who I just mentioned, and former WBO champion Heather Hardy. She's ranked at number four. Could the next WBO champion at featherweight be decided between former champions Daniela Bermudez 
and Heather Hardy. Well, it's a possibility. By way of the WBA. Ignore that Nina Menke is ranked at number one, and you will notice that former champion of Canada, Jelena Marjanovic, she's ranked at number two. Spain's own Jennifer Miranda, she is ranked at number three, the way it looks. Should the WBA title go vacant within the next calendar year, the next WBA champion may be decided between them. Based on how the ranks are looking right now, they are subject to change. The year just got started, and we don't know who's going to be where later on in the year. But so long as these particular fighters stay in the winner's bracket, that's the way the cookie crumbles. And these may be the fighters that Sky Nicholson goes after in pursuit of becoming this division's undisputed champion. Because like I said, I don't think Amanda's going to stick around after the Nina Menke fight. And what Sky Nicholson has over all of these fighters is that she's recognizable. She's a recognizable face. She's a recognizable fighter with a major promotional outfit behind her, boxing on a major platform, set to become a champion very soon. That gives her leverage. The only way for them to get some leverage is to get alphabet titles of their own, but Sky is seemingly beating them to the punch by way of the WBC, which is the only vacant title at this time. It gives Sky Nicholson decent odds against a good number of these fighters, a good number of them. Perhaps it's not them she has to worry about. It's the other unbeaten up-and-comers, like herself, like Raven Chapman, like Kara Sardingstall, like Sophia Leash, like Sarah Liegman. Being the most recognizable fighter at a weight, Ain't all it's cracked up to be. That means there are that many more targets on your back because you're the most recognizable fighter. Hope she's ready for it. It's Sarah Mafood next, and we'll see if she makes it past her. I think she's going to, but it's after that where things start to get interesting for Sky. Men's super lightweight news. Tim Bradley's thoughts on what was the Jermaine Ortiz versus Teofimo Lopez fight, saying that Ortiz controlled every aspect of the fight. The problem was Jermaine's name isn't Sugar Ray Leonard. Uh, Sugar Ray Leonard had a lot more firepower than Jermaine Ortiz did. That's not an adequate parallel. I think what Timothy Bradley needs to do is go back and watch that fight, the first one. It wasn't Leonard on his bike. It was Tommy by the end of that thing. It was Leonard coming forward, and it was Tommy on his bike. In a subsequent interview after the fight, Tim Bradley made it clear that he thought Ortiz deserved the win based on what he felt was Ortiz's quote-unquote ring generalship. Ortiz fought in the southpaw stance for the entirety of the fight and seldom allowed Lopez to carry out a sustained offense. At the same time, Ortiz himself hardly landed any punches. The reason why Ortiz won the fight, he controlled every aspect of the fight. Controlled every aspect by allowing Lopez to put him on the ropes? He's the one that made the fight what it was. Look, a lot of punches weren't thrown and landed. I can probably count on both hands how many punches landed between the two, and I'm talking about effective punches. This fight was a stinker. What are you still talking about? about this thing for because it's not the only fight of its kind it won't be the first time we've seen some sugarfoot guy gliding around the ring all night like he's on ice skates barely landing any punches it's not the first time we've seen that and it won't be the last a lot of these rounds were judged on the second criterion of the scoring it's called effective aggression what does that mean you think that you've got to be aggressive coming out on your front foot no you don't you can be aggressive on your back foot making the guy miss making him pay with counters and that's exactly what ortiz did no he didn't it's called being the ring general. No, it's called giving away the round because you're not doing enough and you're not the champion so you're not going to get the same consideration. That sounds unfair. Life's unfair. You better get used to it because that's the way things work and if you walk in there and you're the challenger, if you fight like Jermaine Ortiz fought, there's a strong probability that you're going to lose. Did Tim really compare this guy to Sugar Ray Leonard? Well, he said the only reason that he lost is because his name isn't Sugar Ray Leonard. Though if you think about that, you think about the Duran fight, the Hearns fight. Time makes people's memory of things hazy, but I advise that everybody go back and watch those fights, some of Leonard's biggest fights. He had more firepower than people remember. Let his hands go a lot more than people remember. But Timothy Bradley continued, there weren't a whole lot of punches thrown between Lopez and Ortiz, Bradley said, but there were more punches thrown than there were in Shakur Stevenson versus Edwin De Los Santos, you know. Shakur fought off his back foot a lot, Ortiz stood his ground in spots, Ortiz even, even when Lopez was mentioning him, to the corner he said, okay, I'll come in the corner, I'll beat you up a little bit more and I'll get back on my game plan. What he's describing happened in the first half of the fight, and I've said it more than once that Ortiz definitely won most of the rounds in the first half of the fight, but he gave it away in the second. The fight itself was a tale of two halves. Ring generalship is a blanket term that is open to interpretation, but what it essentially means is that whatever is happening is happening on one fighter's terms 
more than the other. So when you look at Ortiz and you look at Lopez, if you can't hold the center of the ring and your back ends up on the ropes most of the fight and you're the one that's on the move, on whose terms is that happening? You could see who had the strategy going into the fight from the first round. It was Ortiz. He was the ring general, the ring genius throughout the night. So if you can't score a round based on clean punches thrown, then you score it on who is the ring general. Let's go back to the De Los Santos fight. The ring general was Shakur. He was the ring general. He was fighting when he wanted to fight on his terms. I think it's a little bit naive of Tim to expect that Jermaine Ortiz would get the same consideration as Shakur when Shakur was the reigning champion, the defending champion. You want to pretend that that doesn't matter, but then you explain it. You explain why Shakur got the W for fighting a similar fight to the fight that Jermaine Ortiz fought. Why did one guy win and why did one guy lose? Why did it work for one guy and not the other? Because you're the challenger, that's why. Because you're the challenger, you're not the champion, and you can't afford to do that shit. You need to do more. That's the way it is. The problem was Jermaine's name isn't Sugar Ray Leonard. It's not Shakur Stevenson. It's not Floyd Mayweather, Bradley said. It's the fact that his name is Ortiz. That's what it is. He's not the house fighter. He's not bringing money and electricity to boxing. Guess who is? Lopez is. And that's the reason why he got the decision. That's the only reason why he got the decision. We don't score fights on damage. Oh, you don't? Then what do you call clean punching? What do you call effective aggression? That's MMA. You guys, Pro Box TV hosts Chris Algieri and Pauli Malinaji, sound like you're scoring it on damage. You're talking about how Lopez didn't have a scratch on him. I will admit, that's anecdotal. You don't score around based on how many bruises, how many lumps, and how many bumps, and how many scrapes, how many cuts a guy has. You don't. You don't score it based on how many laps you do around the ring either. Ring generalship is open to interpretation because in a round or in a fight where neither guy is landing all that much, who's actually the ring general? Punching and landing punches has to be the centerpiece of the game plan. And scoring the fight. Scoring the round. So in a round or in a fight where neither guy is landing all that much, it's open to interpretation, but I'll tell you that... Well, you have to do more than just move around and make him miss. You have to, because another way to interpret all of that movement is that you're being put on the ropes, that the other guy's coming forward, you can't hold the center of the ring. You're getting backed up, you're giving up ground. You're retreating, and the only way to offset the notion that you're retreating is to land punches. Land more punches than the other guy. Create space, set traps. Walk him in the shots. And if you're the challenger, you have to, because what are you expecting? Are you actually expecting to get the same consideration from the judges as the champion? Good luck. The sweet science snobs will pretend that staying on your bicycle for the majority of a round or the majority of a fight is somehow skillful when it's more skillful to sit in the pocket and avoid those punches as opposed to staying so far out of range, you're barely fighting. And that's what Ortiz did. That's why he lost. Because that fucking shit doesn't work. No more runners, please. So I don't necessarily agree with Tim's assessment of that fight, but I do agree with Tim when it comes to this one, when he says Ryan Garcia can only beat Romero. He can't beat Haney, he can't beat Matias, and he can't beat Teofimo. I do agree with him on that one. Out of the four current champions at 140 pounds, Bradley views Romero as the weakest link, meaning it makes all the sense in the world for Ryan to have gone after him. The only way Ryan Garcia wins a world championship and the only guy that he could possibly beat at 140 pounds is Roly Romero, Bradley told pro boxing fans. He's not beating Devin Haney, he's not beating Matias, and he's not beating Teofimo Lopez, but... But Roly's spoken for, and we all know that. As counterintuitive as it is for Roly and Roly's bank account, he He's fighting Isaac. Ryan, Ryan's fighting Devin. He doesn't beat Devin. This is a power play for Devin, is what it is. The virtue of Devin Haney fighting Ryan Garcia, who most people are picking him to beat, so much so that it's almost a foregone conclusion. Power play. It's a power play. What's in it for Devin is what was in it for Javante Davis, and that's that this is a very popular fighter, making this a commercially viable fight where you get to make a lot of money without taking on the same risks you would take on to fight, say, a, a Subriel Matias or somebody like that. It's really the highest reward 
for the least risk. And Devin, unlike Javante Davis before him, he's not using any weight stipulations on Ryan. So the perception of the fight, at least to some, is that much more respectable as a result. That Devin isn't looking to weaken this fighter, weaken this man, by imposing a catch weight and a rehydration clause on him. It's good. But he is arguably facing a better version of this fighter than the version of him that Javante Davis fought because Javante Davis weakened him. He handicapped him. Devin doesn't need to do that. Making this fight marketable. You can sell it. Even though Ryan Garcia got knocked out by Javante two Toe. fights Toe. ago, Toe. the circumstances in this fight are different, which ah. makes it marketable. So we see what's in it for Devin, but what's in it for Ryan? Still haven't figured that out yet. Ryan isn't favored to win this fight. And at least in the past, he's put distance between himself and this fight. So what made him change his mind? What made him... Why the 180? Maybe it's because Devin Haney has debuted on pay-per-view. He's been on pay-per-view two times so far. The first time with Vasil Lomachenko and the second time more recently with Regis Progre. Maybe now that they've both boxed on pay-per-view, Ryan feels he can make some money with this thing, win or lose. Maybe he didn't view it that way before, but he views it that way now. I don't think Ryan Garcia is long for the sport of boxing. I don't think he wants to be around for years and years. I don't think he's going to stick around that long. What this could be is Ryan Garcia cashing out. He made a lot of money in that Javante Davis fight. More money than most boxers are ever going to make throughout their entire careers. He made that in a single fight. I don't think this fight is going to sell as many pay-per-views as that fight, but I do think it's going to do well. I do think it's going to do robust numbers. Not as robust as the Davis fight, but enough that they'll both make good money. Maybe what Ryan Garcia is doing is just making as much money as he can while he can, win or lose, because he doesn't plan on sticking around that much longer. Can you imagine this guy trying to fight a Matias or a Lopez or any of those guys up there at welterweight? Can you imagine? Based on how he just looked with Oscar Duarte. Do you think this guy's gonna have a long and healthy career? No. He doesn't have an O to protect anymore, so that throws that out the window. He's just making what money he can make while he can make it. Maybe that's what he's doing. And in some ways, it's smart on his part. He was gonna get beat again. Sooner or later, Golden Boy couldn't protect him forever. It's exactly how Timothy Bradley says it is. The only guy with a belt at this weight that he stood a chance of beating was Roly Romero, but oh. Roly's preoccupied. Roly is spoken for. Roly might lose his next fight. Lose his belt along with it. That's one less option for Ryan Garcia. And Ryan, do you really think that Ryan Garcia is in it for the long haul? Do you think he's in it for legacy? Or does it look a lot like he's just cashing out? So it looks to me. I imagine that Ryan is going to get demoralized in this fight. I imagine that Ryan is going to get a boxing lesson. He's not going to be able to find his way around Devin Haney's stiff jab. I feel like he's going to pick him apart with that thing. Perhaps slice up his face. Slice him up. Ryan who's really not even settled into a base style, a particular base style, not yet. He has the look of a guy who wants to be a boxer puncher. But he's not settled in. He ain't got all the bells and whistles. He's not even really settled in with Derek James. He's only fought with Derek in his corner once. That just once and that was in his last fight it's a young guy in his mid-20s who's already had three all-star trainers three some boxers don't even have one he's already had eddie reynoso in his corner joe goosen in his corner now it's Derek james in his corner there's never been anything stable about ryan garcia or ryan garcia's career that didn't all of a sudden change when i see him buckling down and taking on a fight like this credit to him because i didn't think it was going to happen but it is i didn't think he was going to do it but he is and credit to him for doing it the the only reason I can think of is that he's cashing out. He wants to make as much money as he can make while he can make it. There's no O to protect anymore, so he's going to the bank.